you've seen them before. These large shipping containers traveling on semis down your local freeway, or perhaps being loaded on or off large ships at a port. We may take it for granted, but international shipping is essential to the global economy, and many of the goods you buy have been in a shipping container at some point. International shipping has exploded in step with the world's population, particularly with those industrialized nations that have seen a recent economic boom, such as China. At any given moment, there are approximately five to six million containers in transit. Considering almost a half a billion of these containers are shipped worldwide annually, it shouldn't be a surprise that more than a few are lost at sea every year. The question is, what happens when they do? Dr. Andrew DeVogelaer of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and Dr. Jim Berry of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute had the unique opportunity to begin to answer this very question. Well, in uh, 2004, there was a, a large ship moving containers from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Uh, they hit a storm and 15 containers from their ship fell into the sea and to the bottom of the ocean. One of them was found on the seafloor by a research group seven years later. This provided scientists with the unprecedented opportunity to visit a shipping container that had been resting at almost 4,000 feet below the surface for seven years. Well, we're very fortunate at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to have a partner called Embari. Um, they use engineering to study scientific questions in the deep sea, and they're out there just about every day. Um, we're one of the few people few places in the world where uh, there's this much research activity and we have maybe one of um, six organizations in the world like Mbari that can operate at these deep depths of 4,000 to 15,000 feet. Um, we access the container with what's called a remotely operated vehicle. It's about the size of a car, it's a big robot, and it's attached by a cable to a mothership that's a very sophisticated piece of equipment in the control room of this, uh, the mothership, the Western Flyer, it really looks like a NASA operation. There's so many TV screens and so many people involved. On the remotely operated vehicle, there's sophisticated equipment, uh, high definition cameras to take video and digital stills. Um, there's also a mechanical arm. There's actually two mechanical arms for picking up organisms very lightly or pinching them hard and, and breaking rock. And so um, we can take uh, pictures of organisms and we can also collect them and bring them back to the surface for study. We can also take sediment samples with this remotely operated vehicle. These animals freeze them now and then you can make a decision later and on that's the set point which toxicological assays might be most appropriate. You know, when we uh, were heading off to, uh, to study this container, the main question is, what is the impact of it? Um, does it matter that these containers fall into the deep sea uh, regularly and that they're going to be sitting down there for hundreds, if not thousands of years? So we have this opportunity to study this one container and see what the impacts are to the organisms and the ecosystem down there. So Dr. De Vogelaer and his team tried to answer these questions by looking not only at the fauna and sediments around and on the container, but also areas away from the container, as a baseline was needed to detect any effects the container may have had. The first obvious finding was that everything that uh, was underneath the container when it landed was immediately crushed. Uh, we've also seen that the ecology of the area around the container is changing. So there's a local change to the ecosystem. The, some snails are attracted to the containers. Some predators like uh, crabs and octopi will hang around the container. And so there's a different dynamics of species that are being attracted to it and then being fed upon. Um, we also have some uh, thoughts that the, uh, the container might actually be changing the sediment size and the organisms underneath the sediment because uh, currents uh, move different size uh, sediments differently and the container changes the flow of the deep sea currents. 
With a half a billion containers being shipped annually, the numbers lost at sea vary wildly due to the fact that it is not mandatory to report container losses to all relevant management agencies. You know, the, the most common estimate that's used for lost shipping containers is 10,000 per year. Um, the uh, World Shipping Organization has come up with their own estimate more recently of about 600 containers per year. And in the European Union, they talk about 2,000 lost per year just in European waters. I think the truth is, is that nobody really knows, and that's something that we would like to firm up by working with all our partners on this project. Some may think that if there were 10,000 containers being lost at sea every year, surely we would have found dozens on the seafloor already. Well, not necessarily. Shipping containers have been lost at sea for a long time. Um, they've never been detected before and studied because there are very few people that are actually exploring and looking around in the deep sea. Many of us are familiar with uh, scuba diver depth projects and even those are very localized to the near shore and in certain areas of the coastline. But very few people day to day look in the deep sea and so not only do we not find containers, we know very little about the organisms living down there. Uh, well, we were interested initially with uh, just the impacts of this one container in the one place. But when we learned about just the, the huge number of containers that are being shipped around the world in ships and in trucks all the time, 90% uh, of everything we buy and sell is moved in these kinds of containers. Uh, we thought that the question might be more interesting than that. If the ships are following regular routes from one port to another, and then regularly containers fall off, <clears throat> these containers might be creating stepping stones in the deep for organisms to move across the oceans or from one port to another. So that's one of the hypotheses we'd like to test with our study. So what can the shipping industry do to better protect themselves and the environment? Uh, some of the opportunities for making uh, uh, the shipping business safer are standardizing regulations and how you lash down the containers, uh, standardizing how you, um, uh, if you weigh the containers or not before you put them on the ships so that the ships are well balanced or, or not overloaded. And those are things I think the industry uh, wants to help make better uh, for their industry. Um, I think the industry is also becoming aware that um, a lost container is not just a financial loss, but it's impacting environment we know very little bit about. And uh, the industry is also a lot more interested in firming up or trying to come up with numbers that we can all agree on on how many containers are lost every year. Compensatory fees paid by the shipping company responsible for losing this and other yet undiscovered containers within the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary will not only help support future monitoring of this shipping container, but also a myriad of habitat restorative projects helping the sanctuary's mission to understand and protect the marine ecosystems of Central California. For more information about your National Marine Sanctuaries, visit any of these links or like us on Facebook.